Okay, so sticking with the I guess theme of flow problems that we've done the last couple classes, uh, I decided to uh, finish off by talking about uh, semi-geostrophic flow and how we can use optimal transport techniques to review the semi-geostrophic approximation from a, a different viewpoint um, and uh, gives another way of analyzing the problem uh, and um, also potential for building the numerics for the problem. Um, so similar to last class, I'm not going to do everything in full rigorous detail. Um, this is not a modeling class. Um, what I want to do is I have a finite amount of time to accomplish this in. Uh, but what I want to do is try to explain the basic problem and show how um, we can use the optimal transport techniques to really see this from a different perspective and try to learn more about the problem. Okay, so this is semi-geostrophic flows. <coughs> okay, so what's our assumption here? Again, I'm not going to do all the modeling here, but uh, we're assuming that we have a shallow atmosphere. Um, we're going to assume that the Coriolis, Coriolis effect um, has only a horizontal effect. We can ignore the vertical effects here. So we're going to ignore the vertical effects of the Coriolis force. All right, so uh, the key uh, idea is that we're going to uh, expect here that our flow is somehow close to geostrophic. Uh, so what do I mean by geostrophic? So this is what is going to result from an exact balance okay, between the Coriolis force and the pressure gradient. Oh, and there are actually different ways in, in these models of saying we're close to geostrophic flow. Um, Semi-geostrophic, which we're talking about, there's also quasi-geostrophic, which is slightly different. Okay, so we're going to define this uh, geostrophic velocity. It's the ge so we have a velocity that's not totally geostrophic, that's close to it. So we're going to break it down into two parts. The geostrophic part, which satisfies this balance condition, and then whatever's left over. So we're going to have our geostrophic part here, G, which has different components. <coughs> And again, there's no vertical effects here. Okay, and what do these satisfy? These are going to satisfy F times Vg is equal to the x derivative of our pressure, and minus Fu is equal to the y derivative of pressure. So here, F is this Coriolis parameter, which I'm going to take to be equal to 1. I write it here explicitly just to say that this is a balance, again, between Coriolis force, pressure gradient. Uh, but we'll take F equal to 1 uh, and assume that we scale things and use units appropriately so that this is the case. So the Coriolis force? So the Earth is spinning, right? So we get um, forces, sometimes fictitious forces, uh, as a result of, the result of the spinning of the Earth. <coughs> yeah, it's not a modeling class, but a ask basic questions if you don't understand the words, definitely. Are, are you, UG and VG constant? Uh, no, I'm not assuming they're constant. UG and VG are, are going to vary. They're functions yes, of space and time. Oh, okay. Yeah, so our goal is going to be to try to see how these evolve. Okay. 
Um, so the actual wind velocity, we'll call uh, u. which has three components to it. <coughs> and this, again, we're going to decompose into the geostophic part and whatever's left over that we'll call the ageostophic part. Okay, and then we're making another assumption of hydrostatic balance. Oh, so this is just saying the gravity is balancing uh, the vertical component of the pressure gradient. Okay, so I'm going to have rho g equal to the vertical component of my pressure gradient. <coughs> okay, and Again, I don't feel like carrying around extra, uh, extra constants, so we'll set that equal to 1. And we're in a shallow atmosphere, so taking gravity will be constant is uh, probably a fair assumption here. OK, so this is the evolution equations using this semi-diastrophic approximation. So, in other words, we're assuming not that the velocity flows like this, but that it's close to this, uh, which, which is actually the case uh, in a lot of areas. So this is again a semi-diastrophic approximation. OK, so we're going to basically take the equations that you expect. Uh, and so I have this material derivative, right? Uh, so this, uh, I'll write out what it is. So this is the usual thing. OK, this is the full, uh, the full true velocity. So in the quasi geostrophic approximation, we use just ug here. We're actually going to use the full thing here. Um, where we're changing things is to say, now, how do these velocities evolve? Here, we're going to only look at the geostrophic component. So the material derivative still you know, embedded within here is still the full u. But we're using it to only evolve this geostrophic component. That's the semi-geostrophic approximation. <coughs> OK, and then what do we get? We get a pressure term. We get our uh, force center. Okay. Okay. Our horizontal force rate right, is just a horizontal component of the Coriolis force. So horizontal forces we have Coriolis effects. Vertical force we have gravity. Okay. So we can do this for uh, our different components. Okay, so same deal. We have pressure gradient. We have our Coriolis force. <coughs> and we're going to have a density that's just affected along with. Okay, so the one simplification that I've made in this assumption, this maybe the two simplification, is that we ignore any vertical effects of the Coriolis force. And here, instead of a full U, we only evolve UG. And we assume that that's close to the real thing. Uh, and we're going to be, even though the full U is in here, we're really going to be interested in solving for UG itself. Okay, so let's try to simplify things a little bit. Uh, I'll also write this. We have incompressibility. <coughs> okay, so we can simplify this a little bit. 
uh, because we have some sort of balance between pressure gradient uh, and at least part of this velocity here, right? Okay. So let's simplify using the definition of our geostrophic wind. Okay, so what do I have? I have dUg by dt is equal to minus Px plus V. All right, well, it's minus Px. Px is Vg. So this is minus Vg plus V, which I decomposed. Okay, so this is really just governed by the a geostrophic component of the velocity. Okay, and similarly, if we evolve this guy, it's going to evolve based on just the a geostrophic component. <coughs> yeah? Are we given the a geostrophic We are not given it, no. So, I mean, if we were, if we were given it, then somehow we'd know, we'd know a lot of information already that you'd never expect to have ahead of time. All, all, all we sort of know is that this force, this wind, is kind of dominated by this term. Uh, but no, a priori, we don't know what this is. Oh, but this is interesting when we do this set this up in a clever way and using these optimal transport techniques will kind of actually eliminate these from, from the problem. We won't really have to worry about them anymore. It comes down to say we should pick our, the correct coordinates. Right? So you know you can do things in Eulerian coordinates, you can do things in Lagrangian coordinates. Yeah, it, it makes a little bit of sense to maybe take coordinates that follow the geostrophic velocity somehow, um, because we expect that's kind of dominating the flow. And if we solve our problem in coordinates that follow that, we're kind of naturally going to be able to resolve uh, fronts and things like this. So, so that's, that's really the big goal. Let's try to use the right coordinates here. And OK, you know, you've seen coordinate transformations are really closely connected to optimal transport techniques, right? Um, we've, optimal transport gives us a way of doing, say, a coordinate transformation if it has the right properties. Oh, so that's, I mean, that's the big picture summary. We can almost stop here, is that we do the right coordinate transformation and say, oh, it has exactly these properties of, that we get from an optimal transport type transformation. So let's write down the coordinates. Okay, so I'm going to have two. I'm going to have a normal Lagrangian coordinate that follows along my flow velocity, and then I'm going to try to have something that's another set of coordinates that's evected along with just the geostrophic. Okay, so X, capital X, uh, is a usual Lagrangian coordinate. Okay, so what is this? We start with a particle that is initially at position little x, and it moves along with the flow, the full flow, and at time t, it ends up in the location capital X. Okay, that's for the full velocity. Okay, so we're going to expect that, that this is the case. Now, we also want a set of coordinates that travels along with just the geostrophic part of the flow. Because at the end of the day, we're just trying to solve for the geostrophic part of the flow. So I'm going to say, let's let chi uh, be coordinates that travel uh, with g 
just this geostrophic part. Okay, so what do we want? We want d chi by dt to equal ug. <coughs> okay, so here I'm going to claim something that's going to, you know, we want to write down something explicitly that actually has this property. So I'm going to write something down and then we can check very easily that it has this property. So this is my claim, chi. If I break it down into its components. I'm going to call it its components chi, uh, eta, and c. So this is going to be x plus vg. Again, is, as we said, not constant. Y minus UG. And minus rho. Okay, so I, I claim this is what we want, and we just have to check that really this is the case. So we'll do it component by component. First component, d chi by dt. Um, what's the material derivative of just x? U, U exactly. Right? So partial derivatives of x with respect to t, y, and z are all 0. Partial derivative of x with respect to x is 1. So uh, if we come in here, where did I write this down, right? So it's only the x component of this gradient that matters. So it's only the x component of this velocity that's going to pop up. OK, plus the derivative of this guy. And we've written that down. We know what the material derivative of that guy is. So this is really u minus the ageostrophic component, which is just the geostrophic component. And that's what we wanted. We want, again, we want these coordinates to be affected along with the flow. OK, you can do the same thing with eta. And you can get Vg like you want. And you can do the same thing with C. Just end up with the material derivative of rho, which is zero. So this is this does what we want. This particular coordinate transformation does what we want. Okay. Um, so this this is going to be especially the first two components of this. We're kind of not going to worry about too much about the last component of this. But the first two components of this, we're going to use a lot. So there is a relationship between our two coordinates and our geostrophic velocity. So if I know any two of these three things, I can solve for the third thing. Right? I can put the geostrophic velocity in terms of the different coordinates. Uh, and, and so so that, that's important. We're going to need to kind of put a box around that and not forget it. Okay, so the motion of these new coordinates is geostrophic. <coughs> uh, I can simplify it in other ways. I can also put it <coughs> in terms of pressure, right? These things here balance pressure. And also, rho balances the third component of pressure. It's really a game of playing with these coordinates. So we can also do this. 
pi is x plus x derivative of pressure, y plus the y derivative of pressure, and the z derivative of pressure. And this, this is still something important. This is since we know we're trying to work towards a sort of optimal transport representation of this coordinate transformation, if we're doing quadratic cost optimal transport, how do, what does the map look like usually? What's the optimality condition for the map? Okay. Gradient of a convex function. There we go. This looks like a gradient, certainly. I mean, obviously we've got a gradient of the pressure in here, and, and this is just x and y. We can certainly write that as a gradient of something. So this is nothing but the gradient of x squared plus y squared over 2 plus the pressure. Okay, which I'm going to call this function in here. Okay, now we're going to start by just hoping this function is convex. You know, it's not maybe a stretch to hope that it's convex, you know, at least we're adding something to a convex function. Um, but so for now, let's just say let's hope this is convex. If we're going to do optimal transport, we need it to be. So let us suppose this is convex. So if it's convex, this, you know, this is an optimal transport type map, right? So if we go from here is our x space and here is our c space, this is an optimal map. And then, so if things are nice, you know, this is the gradient of a convex function, we should be able to write down the inverse map as well. Uh, do you know what the inverse map is in terms of this thing? So right back when we looked at the dual problem, we had uh, this pair. When we solved the dual problem, we solved it for this um, convex dual pair, C and C star, right? And the dual problem said, well, if we want to go with the map from mu to mu, we should look at the gradient of C. If we want to go to the map the other direction, we should be looking at the gradient of C star. Right? And this whole formulation was perfectly symmetric between the two. And then neither, neither of them got any preference. So we're looking at one function or its convex conjugate, depending on which way we're going. So we can certainly go backwards here, just by taking the gradient of the Legendre chain. Okay, so we'll write this. X of T C is equal to the gradient of C, C star. All right, so we can go one way, we can go the other way. have two different kinds of coordinates. I have my Lagrange coordinates. I have these geostrophic coordinates. Uh, and now I'm going to combine them. And by uh, this, and this is really the key step, is that when you combine them and look at how this combined Lagrange coordinates evolve, uh, it gives you a really simple, simple, it gives you an alternate system of seeing how do these geostrophic components evolve that you know, kind of eliminates all this other stuff that you don't want to worry about. Uh, and put you in a framework where you might you know, resolve fronts and things like this much more easily. So here's our final, kind of, kind of ugly looking, but 
<laughs> we'll simplify it again. So let's track these geostrophic coordinates. Uh, using our Lagrangian coordinates. And, and combining them, I think combining them makes sense because in the semi-geostrophic approximation, again, we haven't fully eliminated the, the full velocity from the problem, right? Our material derivative still includes this full velocity, well, but it's only the material derivative of the semi-geostrophic component. So they're both in there, so it sort of makes sense that the, the real coordinates that we need to make sense of this are somehow combining both of these. So these are the last coordinates that we want. Call them T. So this is our chi evaluated at T and capital X. And we know that we can write this as a gradient, and we just have to evaluate it at the right place. going to be the evolution of these sort of combined coordinates that really holds, holds kind of the, the answer to coming up with a very simple, a very simple framework for looking at this problem. So, uh, simple in the sense that it's a simple coupled system, but it still involves optimal transport. So how do we do it, I guess? So let's look at how these evolve. So let's take a time derivative. Okay, so we have, I guess, a little bit of chain rule here. Okay, and then we need a gradient of this guy. respect to little x dotted with time derivative of this. And this is all going to be evaluated at time t and location capital X. What's, what's dx by dt? U, exactly. So this is a time derivative of chi uh, plus u dotted with the spatial gradient of chi, which is what? All of this together, what does that give you? It's the material derivative of chi, exactly. You know, we constructed these coordinates chi in such a way that its material derivative would be geostrophic velocity. I know, it's confusing notation. Things, you've got things in, the, in other things. Uh, I said before 
right? This was an important point. We could put this all in terms of our different coordinates, right? So if we, if we want to solve for UG, we can solve for it in terms of the chi coordinates and the x coordinates. So this is nothing but, right, well UG, UG is Y minus eta. VG. VG is chi minus x. And the third component is zero. It's all evaluated at T and capital X. function of the difference between the new and the old coordinates, right? So here we have y minus eta, here we have okay, a minus of x minus chi. It's a, different, it's a function of the difference between these coordinates. So in shorthand, so I'll write it in the long way first and then we'll write it in shorthand. Uh, I'll write it as j chi minus x, uh, eta minus y, uh, C minus Z, right? it's a function of this difference. Where, okay, it's linear in this difference. So we could write this in terms of a matrix multiplication. So what do we have? If we summarize this, we have that these combined coordinates, combined Lagrangian geostrophic coordinates, are evolving as j times chi, evaluated at the right point, minus uh, kappa n. Now, x is also evaluated at capital X. And this, right, this is a complicated nested coordinate, but we don't have to keep nesting forever. We can simplify this. This is how we define t. All right, so this is nothing but j times t of tx minus x of tx. So yeah, this holds the key. We're evolving these coordinates. Um, we're using optimal transport techniques. We, we know that. So we should already know that the determinant of the Hessian of these things uh, is a useful piece of information, right? It talks about volume changes that occur through this coordinate transformation. So what we're really going to end up doing is just trying to say we have a kind of a marker of how volumes change through the coordinate transformation, and, and that ends up holding all the information that we need about the geostrophic velocity. So if we can just say, this is our volume change, let's evolve the volume change symbol. In, inside of that is everything that we want to know. Right, so here's our, our little volume change marker. So let's let alpha uh, be an indicator or a measure 
of volume change uh, in this geostrophic coordinate change. So alpha, I'm going to make it a function of chi because I want to evolve things in geostrophic coordinates, right? At the end of the day, we want a problem that involves things in geostrophic coordinates because that's where we're hopefully going to be able to simplify things. Our original problem was already in our original Eulerian coordinates. Oh, we're trying to get out of that and move towards something that's very geostrophic. So I want this a function of chi. So I want my volume change to be the volume change of, of this guy, the Legendre transform, uh, because he's the one that's a function of chi. Okay, so what I really want is just to evolve alpha. Uh, and it's, I'll show you in a couple lines, but from alpha we can get everything else that we want. <coughs> okay, so if we know alpha, uh, what can we get? Well, if we know alpha, if we have a simple rule for evolving alpha, Revolving the volume changes. Well, we can certainly get C star, right, if we, by solving a motion pair equation. So by our motion pair equation. <coughs> From C star. We can go from our geostrophic coordinates back to our original coordinates. So we get back to our original coordinates. know how to map back into our original coordinates, and I, I tried to make a point of this before. If we know both of our different coordinates, we can solve for the geostrophic velocity, right? Those three things are all coupled together in a nice, simple, linear relationship. So from this, we can get ug, which was y minus eta. using this, right, x and y are the partial derivatives of c star. So this is the partial derivative of c star. And we had that dg was equal to chi minus x, <coughs> which again, x is the partial derivative of c star. for evolving alpha. Alpha is just a scalar valued function of space and time in these particular coordinates. So if we have a simple rule for evolving just this scalar valued function, everything that we want pops out, right? You have to be able to solve a motion pair equation, but you know, is that worse than solving Auger Stokes? Not necessarily. Uh, and we're working in coordinates that are very natural for the problem. Again, coordinates that track what's going on will sort of naturally resolve fronts. Yeah. So alpha, is alpha is the Jacobian, exactly, of the mapping. Okay, so to evolve it, what do we need? We need an evolution rule, and we need the initial conditions for alpha. 
initial conditions for alpha are going to fall right out of the initial conditions for our original problem. So uh, we need initial conditions for alpha. Uh, and this comes from the initial conditions for our original problem. So again, in our original problem, we're sitting in our layering coordinates. We know our x and our y. Uh, we know the initial data for this. That means we can do our coordinate transformation. We can get our chiotic coordinates. So this means we can compute the initial coordinate transformation. Which is the gradient of some function. So from that, we should be able to compute the initial psi and the initial Legendre transform of psi. <coughs> and if we know these things, we know alpha initially, because alpha is the determinant of the Okay, so the initial conditions are easy. Now what we need, we need a rule for evolving alpha. Okay, alpha is very in intimately connected to these coordinate transformations. So the rule for evolving alpha should come out of how these coordinate transforms evolve. Um, so it's really this guy here, uh, I've summarized it over here, this guy here, which is kind of the simplest boiled down rule for how these coordinates, these combined coordinates evolve, that's going to tell us how alpha should evolve. So what I'm going to do <coughs> is try to write this in a weak form. So I'm going to introduce a compactly supported test function, right, multiply and integrate, and then we're going to do a little integration by parts and see what we can get. Come up. Do coordinate do change the variables where we need to and try to get alpha to pop up. Okay, so we're going to introduce a test function. C is going to be say this compactly supported C infinity function has as many derivatives as we want. So what do I want? I want it compactly supported in space uh, and I want it to vanish for a long time. I, I can't have it vanishing at the initial time because I don't want to lose information about my initial conditions. Uh, so I'm going to write it this way. For some, for some uh, capital, I use capital T which might not be the best thing. Let's say that it it is compactly supported in minus tau, tau crossed R3, just for some positive time. So all I'm saying by this is that we really don't care what happens to this thing for negative time, um, but I'm just saying I don't want to force it to vanish at time zero. So I have something that vanishes for a long time and vanishes uh, if we're far enough out in space. Okay, let's multiply and integrate. So we're going to integrate from 0 to tau. Again, after that, uh, this test function vanishes. We can do this for all different values of tau. Okay, 
Okay, so on the left hand side, I have t by t. <coughs> and okay, this is a vector. I'm going to dot it with the gradient. Let's see, I need a vector. Evaluated at T and capital T. <coughs> and same deal with the right hand side. I have J times T minus big X. Dotted with the gradient of C. <coughs> so this guy here. This guy is almost but not quite a total derivative of t. Right, so uh, c rather, sorry. Right, because what would I need for a total derivative of c? I would need a time derivative with respect to it, which I don't really have yet, but I would also need a gradient of c dotted with the time derivative of, of this guy. So we're close. We can write it in terms of a total derivative minus some correction factor. So the left-hand side is almost a total derivative of, of uh, c. So if we had a total derivative, it would really be this. It would be time derivative, partial with respect to time, plus spatial gradient dotted with time derivative of t. includes one of these terms. So we can rewrite the left hand side in terms of its total derivative and a total derivative is easy to integrate. Okay, so the left hand side is going to be the difference between the total derivative of C and partial derivative with respect to time. Okay, this is easy to integrate, right? This, if I integrate, all that pops out is an initial condition. Right? The final condition, which we know that C is compactly supported, uh, and then an initial condition. So what am I going to get? I'm going to get an integral over R3 of C at 0. And then whatever is left. Okay, so what was our goal? Our goal was to try to make alpha pop out, right? So all I did, I started by saying the evolution of these combined coordinates is probably important, but let's put it in a weak form. So I wrote it down in a weak form. But now what I really want is to make alpha pop out. 
alpha was this guy, that means I should probably do a change of variables, right? If I do a change of variables, then I need to include a Jacobian term, and, and this looks like a good Jacobian term, right? So I need a change of variables that will make this Jacobian pop out. Okay, so let's do a change of variables. else do I want? I want I want everything in terms of chi basically at the end of the day, because that's what we're trying to evolve. And this T this T is here as a temporary measure, so we don't want it there forever. So let's try this one. Chi as T. Right, which we knew to be gradient of C. to know what to do with my d-axis. Right, so what is my dx going to become? Well, we can undo this a little bit, right? We know, we know, we know that we can undo this coordinate transformation. We can go forward or we can go backwards just using the Legendre transform. So we have x of tx is going to be the same thing, but now with c star. OK, and that means if I want a d little x, you know, how d little x is related to d big x? I'll give you a hint. The flow is incompressible. They should be, yeah, exactly. They should be equal, right? So this, remember, was Lagrangian coordinates that followed the actual true flow. And the actual true flow was incompressible. So I can't have these actual true coordinates creating volume changes on me but because because these aren't allowed. So little dx is equal to big dx, which is equal to the determinant of the Jacobian of this map, right? Which is alpha. The notation is messy all around here, but there's but there's a goal. I took I took the evolution equation that I expected to be important and just wrote it down in weak form. And I said I need to just do something to make this pop out. This is the thing that I think that I care about. Uh, so let's try to do let's try to use. You know, we've got lots of coordinate transformations to choose from. Let's pick one that makes this pop out. Also, uh, also try to pick high. Yes, thank you. Okay, so we can put this all the way through. Uh, I have this was my left hand side here. So uh, now my t's are going to become uh, chi. Okay, so I have a chi of z uh, sorry, a c of zero and chi. Any spatial integral gets an alpha attached to it. Mm 
Okay, and then this term, I do the same thing. So time derivative of C, and now evaluate it at chi. I get an alpha. That was my left-hand side, and this was my right-hand side. Okay, so in my right-hand side, uh, what happens? T becomes chi. <coughs> Capital X uh, becomes gradient of C star. All right, so we're trying to put everything in terms of chi. So I'm going to have an integral of 0 to tau, R3, integral over R3 of J times T king chi minus the gradient of C star dotted with the gradient of C. Times alpha. Chi dt, I lost the dt here. This is good. I've brought in alpha. Uh, everything is in terms of chi now. I don't have any weird nested variables anymore. Uh, and what do I want out of this? I wanted an evolution equation for alpha. So how do I pull out an evolution equation for alpha? I integrate by parts, of course. That's what you always do. When in, you know, if you're an applied mathematician and you don't know what to do, you either tailor or expand or you integrate by parts. And right now, integration by parts is looking more promising. Hold on, I'm fine. I think it's parts, and I usually prefer Taylor expansion, but but in this case, no. Okay, so let's let's just combine these terms together before I integrate by parts. Uh, I'm just going to bring everything to one side of the equation. Okay, so everything over this combined integral is c by dt plus j times c minus gradient of c star uh, dotted with grab c times alpha okay, plus another term that only is integrating over space. This has my initial conditions in it. initially, alpha initially, all this equal to zero. Okay, so I want to integrate by parts. That's what we know that. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take a time derivative off of this and move it on to alpha. Um, I'm going to get an initial condition, right? So what am I going to get initially? I'm going to get uh, minus c initially times alpha initially. I happen to have sitting here plus c initially times alpha initially. So, so this initial condition is going to vanish this initial condition. Right, all that happens is I move the derivative onto alpha. So I'm going to get minus okay, we get a d alpha dt okay, times xi hold off on writing the xi because I expect him to pop up again Okay, I do integration by parts over here. Um, this guy is compactly supported in space, right? So there's no boundary terms. So all that happens is this gradient is going to hang out over here instead, right? So what am I going to get? I'm going to get a divergence of all of this. Times. 
Okay. That looks like an evolution of the sciatica, right? This holds for every appropriate compactly supported C. <coughs> so this is nothing but the weak form of the equation. Uh, d alpha by dt plus the divergence of alpha j c minus grad c star equals zero. This is certainly an evolution equation. Uh, and now we can try to simplify it a little bit, right? Because I mean, J was J was a placeholder to to be able to write this in a simple form, as we were manipulating along the way. But I can put in explicitly what these terms are. Uh, so let's do it. What do we have? We have the alpha by dt plus. Okay, we have a derivative with respect to x of something. Uh, so this is going to be alpha times, and here we had uh, minus eta plus the eta derivative of c star. That was the x derivative term. Uh, this should be a pi by the eta. Same deal, but with uh, opposite sign. We have a chi minus eta star derivative with respect to chi. Okay, and then the third component of this was zero, because the last row of j was zero. I'll simplify this a little bit more. We're going to get some calculations happening. Um, so what's going to happen here? Uh, if we take derivatives, so if we hold alpha fixed and take derivatives with respect to chi, um, this goes away. I have a mixed derivative. Uh, on the other hand, if I hold alpha fixed here and take derivatives with respect to eta, this goes away have a mixed derivative but with the opposite sign, right? Um, so there's not going to be any term that just has the, the alpha fixed and derivative of everything else. I hope everything else fixed and take derivatives with respect to alpha. That's the only non-trivial terms popping up. Okay, so what do I get? I get d alpha by dt plus minus eta plus the eta star times d alpha by dx plus chi minus derivative with respect to chi, d alpha by d eta equals zero. Do you know another name for this term here? We've actually seen it before. Well, let me remind you of this. The little x was the gradient c star as a function of my chi coordinates. Right? So that means this is nothing but little y. This is nothing but, I'm oh sorry, this is nothing but little x. So what do I have? I have a combination of eta and y. Now we said at the beginning, if I know both of my coordinates, I know my geostrophic velocity, right? They're all in terms of each other. So this, these coefficients here are nothing but the geostrophic velocity. The thing that we actually really care about at the end of the day. So this is really the alpha by dt plus 
the geostrophic velocity dotted with the gradient of alpha is equal to zero. <coughs> Should we get that in the very beginning? Maybe. Is it obvious? It's basically the continuity equation, yeah. Oh. I guess the thing that we didn't know was what's the right velocity to put in it. So, so yes, we should expect something like that. You shouldn't be surprised to see something like that. Now, what we've done is set the problem up in a clever enough way that we got the velocity out that we actually wanted. Because this is, you know, if I had a, a you sitting in there at the end of the day, I'd say, okay, well, you know, I'm kind of trying to eliminate you from the problem and say that's not the important part. So, yes, we should expect to see this. And, of course, we set this up in a clever way where this is what we got. So what do we have at the end of the day? We obtain this coupled system. Okay, so we have this evolution equation. Coupled to an optimal transport problem. <coughs> okay, and it's coupled through this knowledge that right UG is minus eta plus C eta. The G is chi minus C star chi. Um, so what does this do for us? I mean, on the one hand, it puts it in a, you know, it's still, it's not a, it's still not a simple problem to solve. You know, it's, a, it's another means of doing numerical solution, right? You know, we started with a problem that was hard to solve numerically. We have another system that's still, you know, not easy to solve numerically when you have optimal transport coupled to other things. Um, the coordinates are more natural, though, right? Again, you're going to be able to resolve fronts in your data uh, more naturally here. But what else happens here? Um, analytically, you can study existence of solutions to this problem, and you may be able to do it. In fact, you can uh, do it more easily than the original problem. Um, so this is something that you know Mike Cullen and others did is say, let's study this problem. Let's prove existence of concave solutions to this problem with convex C. All of a sudden you have existence of solutions to this problem. You can backtrack it through to your original problem and say, ah, I have existence of solutions to my semi-geostrophic approximation. Oh. So uh, in terms of the numerics, I'm not sure that anybody has implemented this numerically. Um, it might be useful, it might be very natural, but in terms of the analysis, this gave the tools for an really analyze, analyzing the original hard problem. Um, and I think in the end, they showed that ha having this be convex um, corresponded to some kind of energy minimizing flows that actually you know, makes sense physically. Any other questions there? 